I have included as a paper in your papers here an article called Misguided Fears About the International Criminal Court. In that paper, I took all the American objections to the court, which have been stated repeatedly, and pointed out that they're not persuasive, that the objections are wrong. Uh, the biggest objection, of course, is the first one. Oh, the prosecutor is going to persecute American soldiers. He's going to threaten them uh, with unfair trials, or as um, Congressman uh, DeLay said, it's a kangaroo court of, of Kofi Annan to, trying to grab our boys and girls, you know, and, and subject them to all kinds of things like that. It's baloney. It's not true at all. There's no way in the world that this prosecutor could do that. We have another American prosecutor sitting here, David Crane. You'll hear from him later in the afternoon. He'd be fired like a shot. This prosecutor is, first of all, subject to the control of the Assembly of State Parties. The Assembly of State Parties are all those nations that have ratified the Rome Statute and accepted it as binding law. Great Britain is one of them. Canada, Australia, the entire European community. And the prosecutor himself is selected as a great human rights advocate. I know him quite well. I was there and made the uh, welcoming address when he was sworn in. Uh, to say that this man poses a threat and that this system poses a threat is ridiculous. It's plain stupid. And uh, in addition to that, of course, the statute provides that every state has primary jurisdiction over the accused. If they arrest an American, they're obliged by the statute to be in touch with the United States to say, do you want to try him? If you want to try him, we deliver him to you. And if he gets a fair trial, that's the end of it. They have no jurisdiction whatsoever in such cases. There are dozens of other controls of all kinds. The prosecutor can't start an investigation without approval by three judges. They can appeal that, and then it goes to five judges. I don't know how they're going to convict anybody, frankly. Uh, <laughs> but Americans say, oh, that's a menace. Read the article. Read the other articles. Don't believe a word I say. You are lawyers. Look it up yourself. Figure it out for yourself. I stand by everything I have ever written or said. But don't accept it. Your lawyers, challenge it. Because there are good lawyers who disagree. And make up your own mind. What kind of a world do you want? Do you want a world like this, poised, on the verge of exploding at any moment? Freedom of fear, one of the four freedoms which Roosevelt was advocating after the World War. Freedom of fear. The country has never been so afraid. I've never seen the country this much afraid, and I've lived a long time. Is this the kind of a world you want? If you don't want it, you don't like it, and I don't, but it's not my world anymore. I'm going to be 86, my next birthday. Um, he's a little bit older. <laughs> <laughs> I should <debate> that. <laughs> um, if you don't like this world, then do something about it as lawyers. And um, I think you can. Now, why do I think you can? I'm perfectly aware that the most difficult thing to do in the world is to change the way people think, particularly on very firmly held, strongly held uh, traditions. You have religion, nationalism. People are ready to die for those ideas and kill for those ideas. And you can't talk them out of it quickly. There's no way in the world that you can do that. But I look back at history and I see, first, the American Revolution. They took the idea of sovereignty. Sovereignty belongs to the king. And they said, no, it doesn't. It belongs to the people. Great idea. Great idea. Today, everybody knows that people have their own democratic rights in every democracy. Look at our Constitution. Women had no rights. They couldn't vote. They couldn't own property. Look at it today. No man would dare make a suggestion <laughs> along those lines. They'd beat him up. <laughs> Look at our civil war. We went to war. The nation was torn apart over the idea that a white man is entitled to own a black man as a slave. It's necessary for our economy, for our well-being. Today, no one, I hope, will express such an opinion. When I went to school, there was no such thing as international criminal law. Today, we have international criminal courts. We have a representative here, an American, a prosecutor of one of the courts set up. We have the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, International Cr 
criminal tribunal for Rwanda. Admittedly too late. Admittedly, 800,000 people get butchered before we set up a court. Disgrace to our civilization, an absolute disgrace. After the Holocaust, for us to know that it is likely to happen and let it happen, uh, and then come later and set up a court, well, it's better than nothing. It's a question of what do you do? You can't try. They had 200,000 murderers in jail. Not in jail, in boxes, treated like rats. Uh, because we had not developed the institutions that we need in order to have a more rational society. And the most important institution from our point of view as lawyers, of course there are a million points in this matrix which have to be fixed before we'll have a perfect world or a more tolerable world. The most important institution is the International Criminal Court, a permanent court, instead of having ad hocs growing up here and there. So if I look back on this, I say that there is progress being made significant progress, uh, but it will take perseverance and patience and education and a lot of it. But I think we have an obligation to those who perished, to our own profession as well, to never stop trying to make it a more peaceful and humane world. And I think if you do that, I've been doing it for f over 50 years, I'm confident that the world will gradually move toward a more civilized structure. And you may have, I hope, a more peaceful and humane world than I had. Thank you very much.